Welcome to this talk that marks the 25th birthday of online Mendelian inheritance in animals, known as OMEA. My aim here is to present a summary of how OMEA came into existence and how it has developed in the past 25 years, and then just to make a few comments on its future challenges. In presenting this story, I will mention some of the people who have contributed to OMEA over the decades. In fact, the entire history of OMEA is, in essence, a series of collaborations with remarkable people from all over the globe. It has been an enormous privilege for me to be able to work with so many special people. It is just not possible for them all to be mentioned in this talk. As I will say at the end, they are all acknowledged on a special page of the OMEA website. In assembling this story, it has been amazing to be reminded of just how recent are many of the developments that we now take for granted as being central to biological science. I hope that the younger people who listen to this talk may gain a greater appreciation of just how different scientific life was only a couple of decades ago and how fortunate we are now to have the power of the internet and all its tools available to us. We start with some prehistory. <clears throat> Back in 1974, I was appointed lecturer in animal genetics here at the University of Sydney. And this meant that I received many queries from breeders and from veterinarians, uh, particularly about inherited disorders or disorders that people thought might be inherited. And I was asked, is this so? And if so, what sort of um, control strategy is possible uh, to try and um, minimize the occurrence of these disorders? This involved many trips to the library, uh, photocopying particular papers, trying to make sense of all the information and then responding to the query. In the course of doing this, I became aware uh, that a human geneticist had faced a similar problem back in the 1960s. His name was Victor McCusick, now known as the grandfather of human genetics in many ways. Uh, and uh, in the 1960s, he'd started to assemble information about inherited disorders in humans. Uh, and he'd compiled this into a catalogue that he called Mendelian Inheritance in Man. And being a great innovator, as soon as computing technology became available, he started to enter all this information into a computer. But the only way this could be done back in the 60s was by what we now call uh, a single flat ASCII file with everything in uppercase letters. Uh, and so Victor had no structure to his file at all. He was just obliged to enter the information exactly as he wanted people to be able to read it when he printed it out. He actually created print editions, hard copy editions of this catalogue. The first one was in 1966. And uh, by the time I got to know about this, uh, the fifth edition had just been published in 1978. In that same year, I attended the International Congress of Genetics in Moscow and I knew that Victor was there, and so I uh, introduced myself to him and said that uh, I would very much like to create an animal equivalent of Mendelian inheritance in man. And he said, fine, go to it. Uh, and we agreed to keep in touch. Uh, I realized then, and I discussed this with him, that um, the plan would be to model uh, my catalogue as much as possible on, on his, and so I was going to call it Mendelian Inheritance in Animals, but that there would be uh, a major difference, and that is that I had to deal with many species, whereas he had just one. So this added a, another dimension of complexity to compiling the information and putting it together in a useful way. But it also had the big advantage of then bringing in comparative biology uh, because it, if, it, if this was done properly, then it would provide a really powerful way for people to compare what is known about a disorder in one species with, a, with that same disorder in another species. In 1980, uh, I, was, uh, uh, I was lucky enough to receive a small grant uh, and we got to work. Steve Brown, a colleague, um, created a bibliographic database on a university mainframe computer. And this represented a, an enormous advance um, uh, over what Victor was still dealing with at that time. He was, he was captive to having been innovative uh, because he was still stuck with his big single no structure flat file, whereas uh, we were able to start with a structured bibliographic database 
with different fields for different for the date and the author's name and text and other things. And this was an enormous advance that Steve was able to organise. I was able to employ Jan Graham and her job was to go to the library and, and to make photocopies of all the relevant papers and to enter the bibliographic details into Steve's database. So during the 1980s, there was a lot of effort uh, in um, uh, Jan chasing up the reference backlog and entering those into uh, the database. Um, and then my job was partly to write text, summary text for each of the disorders, and then to allocate them a six digit identification. And I did this um, following what Victor McCusick had done with, the, with, with his human catalog there. He'd allocated a, a six digit identifier to every different disorder. Uh, and this made a lot of sense. And, and his were partly informative, but uh, the, I decided uh, that mine would just be completely unin, uninformative, but they would, be, they would be six digits. So they weren't the same as Victor's, but they were six digits unique identifiers for that particular uh, disorder. This was quite a big deal in the 1980s. Uh, here we are on the front page of the University of Sydney News in September 1981. A very young Sydney geneticist with Jan Graham, the one who did all the legwork in the library and the entering the bibliographic details. Actually, we got the whole front page of the University of Sydney News. 1987 saw the launch of an online version of MIM, which was obviously called OMIM. Uh, Victor achieved this by taking his flat ASCII file uh, and teaming that up with a, a search engine called IRX that had been developed specifically for Victor by the National Library of Medicine. And this resource was made available uh, through the Johns Hopkins Medical Library and also through the National Library of Medicine. The next year saw the birth of NCBI, the National Centre for Biotechnology Information. This, this became very quickly one of the world's leading bioinformatics resources. Uh, interestingly, the word bioinformatics was fairly new at the time, and that must be the reason why it wasn't actually included in the name of this organisation. It was the child of the National Library of Medicine and is still very closely affiliated with it. In 991, uh, the World Wide Web became available to the outside world. And this was an enormous innovation. And it soon became evident to me that this would be a wonderful means of making Mendelian inheritance in animals available to the world. That same year, uh, the Australian National Genomic Information Service was founded at the University of Sydney by Peter Reeves and a number of other colleagues. But it was basically Peter's idea. Peter's still uh, working at the university now. Uh, and the idea was that uh, to to create an organisation that would be the bioinformatics facility for for um, Australia, and it became that and operated in that manner uh, for uh, quite a long time. So this was an, a real boon for me because it meant that there were people who were right at the cutting edge of bioinformatics providing a national service that were on the same campus as I was. And I, I had some very fruitful discussions with these people, particularly with Carolyn Buckholz, who was their most senior programmer. And I learned a lot of bioinformatics in the next few years. We kept in touch with NCBI and with Victor McCusick, uh, and they were both enormously helpful to us. So with all this effort, 25 years ago, on the 26th of May 1995, the online version of Mendelian Inheritance in Animals was launched uh, on an ANGUS server. And this is what the home page looked like. And this was its rather complicated domain name. How do we know all this? Well, there's this wonderful resource um, that's part of the National Library of Australia called Web Archive. There's also an international one. Uh, this is the Australian one, and it started in early 1996 uh, when web pages really got going. Uh, and from then on, they've been taking snapshots of web pages, and they now assembled them all in this very searchable uh, resource uh, from the National Library of Australia. And it enables you to uh, uh, retrace the history of many different websites. And that's where I've got uh, these images that I'll be showing you today. 
people that that were also mentioned on that first home page uh, because of their enormous contribution Steve Brown we've already met um, Paul Letizia uh, is an English um, scientist who came out here on a postdoc to work with my colleague Chris Moran for three years and during that time Paul became really interested in OMEA and made some major contributions in those very early years. Jan Graham of course had made a big contribution as well uh, and she deserved an enormous vote of thanks. Carolyn Buckholz, I've already mentioned her but she was the person who did all the coding that enabled um, this to happen and uh, she also provided that image uh, she insisted we had to have an image and she found this uh, image of Noah's Ark in a, a cross-stitch catalogue and she was very happy to put that on the web page. How it actually happened was that I exported a flat file from our um, MIA database uh, and then Carolyn put that together with uh, that same IRX search engine that had been developed by the National Library of Medicine was now being run by NCBI that was uh, uh, that had been developed for a victim accusing um, flat file so that meant that both the human catalog and the animal catalog were using the same search engine which was a real plus and we were very grateful to NCBI and Victor for that help. As far as I've been able to determine, the University of Sydney's first web page didn't go up until at least October 1995 and possibly a little bit later. So it appears uh, that OMEA might have actually beaten the University of Sydney to having a web page up and running. In May 1997, a couple of years later, uh, Angus were able to simplify the domain name a little um, and we used that for a long time. In that same year, in June 1997, NCBI launched PubMed. And this is a bit amazing. You tend to think that PubMed's been there forever. Uh, it's now such a central resource for biological science, but it was actually launched. It's younger, PubMed is younger than OMEA. Later that same year, uh, with, with enormous help from NCBI, David Lippmann in particular, the boss of NCBI, and Joanna Amberger, who was one of the key uh, people who actually um, uh, enabled OMIM to keep on working. So with great help from them, we established reciprocal hyperlinks between the two. And this was making use of the enormous power of the internet. And we were able to make use, we were able to link two together via those six digit um, IDs, those unique six digit IDs. And so basically the idea was that um, each week OMIM uh, comes and hacks into the the OMEA the OMEA online site and downloads a list uh, of 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 all the um, the relevant information where where I have determined that there is a, a human equivalent of an animal um, an animal disorder and then they they mount that on their on their database uh, and then any human uh, human medico who's looking at the OMIM catalog for a particular disorder then they can click on an animal models link and they'll get taken straight to all the information in OMEA and that's been going on since 1997. It's a very powerful use of of uh, the uh, the internet and and by the same way because I uh, the way I indicate that an animal uh, an animal disorder has a human equivalent is to actually enter the OMIM six digit ID in a particular field and so anybody looking at um, at, at OMEA any veterinarian or breeder um, if there is a human equivalent of this then then um, they can just on the click uh, of a mouse they can they can see that entry in OMIM. So what we now uh, have is is a highlighting really of animal models of human disorders uh, for those in the medical world and what we can call human models of animal disorders for those in the veterinary world. Now, uh, a couple of years later, a very important move was that Angus actually physically moved uh, into the gun building within the Faculty of Veterinary Science, became part of the Faculty of Veterinary Science, and that was enormously helpful to me. Um, uh, the downside of that was that for a while, six months, uh, when they were um, in between directors, I actually became the acting, acting director of, um, of Angus. The very close and continued interaction with Angus 
resulted in September 2005 with an interactive website, and it's impossible to convey the excitement that this created at the time. It was all due to the then new director of uh, Angus, Mike Portinger, uh, who did a wonderful job. He took the the um, all the information from the database in, into which we'd been putting in information, he took that and put it into a MySQL database, teamed it up with a, a more modern search engine and created some curator tools as well. Uh, and this was, this was just so special because what this meant was that I could then log in as a curator and do some editing and then just refresh the the screen and there the results of the editing would be uh, visible e everything had happened uh, and this was just it was a revelation to me it was also a revolution many people were involved in this apart from from mike and they're listed here and i'm very grateful to each of them for what they did we're now up to 2011, by which it had become evident that what we could call a next generation website was needed. And another colleague, Matthew Hobbs, uh, did all the enormous effort that was involved in creating this. And this is the website we still use today. Matthew did a wonderful job. Another thing that happened in 2011 was that uh, the OMIR ID became binomial. Up until then, we'd just been using the six digit ID for the trait, normally a a, a disorder, uh, but when we wanted to specify the species, then we just used it a, a homegrown list that I had created, and there were all sorts of inconsistencies in this. And I became aware that NCBI had created what it called a taxonomy database, and here they gave a numeric ID to every animal species, and this had become the global standard, and so it made so much sense for us to adopt this. And so the OMIR ID then became binomial. Uh, the first six digits uh, were the the, um, the original OMIR ID for that particular trait or disorder, and then a hyphen, and then followed by the NCBI taxonomy ID for the species. And this, this standardized the species nomenclature, and it made it far, far easier for people to search on information for a particular species. In 2013, OMIR's reach was greatly extended by two very fruitful collaborations, uh, one with uh, Jim Reesey and Ji Lang Hu, who together run the USA animal bioinformatics resource called animalgenome.org, and with colleagues at the European Bioinformatics Institute, their resource being Ensemble. And the idea was that both these organizations would regularly hack into the OMIR um, the OMIR database and they would extract relevant information and incorporate into their own databases so that they could then provide links back to OMIR for um, relevant genes in uh, each of their um, resources. So here we have, for example, the, uh, uh, the cattle genome browser from animalgenome.org and here we have information on a particular gene, FANC1, and then down here, Ji Lang has incorporated basically an OMIA track in this genome browser. Uh, and here's all the relevant information uh, that provides you with the link straight back to OMIA uh, about a mutation, the effect of a mutation in that particular gene in cattle. And here we have the ensemble resource. And you can see there, there's a list of all the non-human animal species that ensemble includes. And then uh, here we have uh, just the first few of those in alphabetical order. And you can see that one of the data sources for cat, for example, is OMIA, and for chicken is OMIA, and for cow is OMIA. At Ensemble, for example, we have here a particular horse gene. Um, and then if we look at the phenotypes associated with that gene, then we have a, a link back to OMIA for information on a mutation that results uh, or the phenotypes that result from a mutation in that particular gene. And these are very powerful uses of, of the internet. And I'm very grateful to the collaborations that have made these possible. 
Another thing happened in 2013 was the OMEA support group was established. Uh, this was very much thanks to Zilang and Jim at Iowa, uh, the people who run animalgenome.org and the, uh, the website for that group is um, they're part of animalgenome.org and I'm very grateful to Zilang and Jim for that help. The wonderful collaboration with uh, Jim and Zilang continued in 2014 and 15 when they led two grant applications to the USDA for three major enhancement projects for OMEA. Uh, unfortunately, in both cases, the applications uh, were not successful. They were near misses, but the impetus from the creation of those and the writing of those grants um, has had some very fruitful Results, uh, I was able to take the, uh, the proposal that we put for uh, creating tables of like the causal variants uh, to Sydney Informatics Hub and, and they were able to provide me with the services of a marvellous software engineer and this task was actually achieved in 2017. That was a major enhancement so that OMEA now provides lots of detail uh, about um, like the causal variants. Uh, the text mining project was also taken up by Sydney Informatics Hub and that became a reality in 2018 thanks to yet another amazing software engineer that they were able to provide to do that job. The ontologies project is still uh, awaiting uh, resources for doing this, but the people who are, who are uh, keen to do this, Chris Mungle, uh, Melissa Handel and Peter Robinson, uh, key players in what's called the Monarch Initiative, which is a global ontology uh, project. And the aim here is to develop a standard set of uh, nomenclature and words for describing phenotypes so that uh, databases that have all this information, such as OMEA, can talk with each other. And it would be a big step forward. And we're very optimistic that um, sometime in the not too distant future, we'll be able to do this project. In 2015, um, I was able to purchase for the princely sum of 425 US dollars, the domain name omea.org. I did this because I wanted to highlight the uh, relationship, the close relationship between OMIA and OMIM, whose domain name is omim.org. So that um, a similarity of these two domain names just reinforces the idea that, that OMIM and OMIA are complementary resources. And it also, not having anything to do with any nationality, uh, it stresses that OMIA is a global resource, just like OMIM. And that then saw the retirement of the um, uh, of the domain name that included the word Angus uh, after 18 years of very faithful service. Uh, and that was the end of a final public link with Angus. As it so happens, Angus had actually closed years before uh, because as NCBI and Ensemble uh, became more and more useful in uh, the, the, the services that, that, um, that Angus was providing to Australian biologists were no longer needed. But Angus had been a, just an amazing resource, very, very pioneering in, in its, um, what it was able to achieve. And certainly without Angus, I would have been completely lost. But there's also been uh, wonderful um, the wonderful contributions by other people as well. Uh, Vicky Mayers Wallen, whom I've never actually met from the College of Vet Medicine in Cornell, approached me and, and she said she had organized a team of US veterinarians and they worked on a whole lot of dog and cat entries in OMEA. And this is all able to be done remotely because of the interactive nature of the web. So I could register these people as curators and then off they went and did the curating and every change they made then just became visible to everybody else. An amazing development. A couple of years later, Carrie Finnow from the School of Vet Medicine at Davis, uh, she revised many of the horse entries in the context of a revised review that she published the next year for horses. And since 2007, Ernie Bailey from the, the vet school at the University of Kentucky has actually been teaching a course on OMEA where he allocates students uh, each, each student is allocated one or more OMEA entries in horses that um, need some attention uh, and then they do the enhancements and they send them to me and we interact uh, to get a final version and then their final version is mounted um, and they are appropriately acknowledged. 
So we now look at the present context. We, here we have our, um, our um, global um, URL, omia.org, and we have the front page of um, Matthew Hobbs' latest version of the website. We now cover 251 animal species. We, we, we don't cover mouse or rat because they have their own databases. And obviously we don't cover humans because that's covered with OMEM, but we try to cover everything else. We have um, many people, uh, a huge number of people, who wonderful people who've contributed to OMEA over the years, and there's no way I can mention them all in this talk, but they are all mentioned uh, on the website. We also have a team of specialist curators. I've been able to register a number of people, including Vicky and her colleagues, as curators, and from time to time those people actually make a contribution. And of course, this can be done from anywhere in the world. Now, just to summarize the current contents uh, of OMEA, the total number of, of Mendelian traits, uh, most of which are disorders, is nearly 1,500. Uh, and there's a distribution of them amongst the major uh, domesticated animal species. And then a subset of those are the Mendelian traits or disorders for which at least one likely causal mutation has been discovered. And there's 871 of those altogether. So that's a pretty, a pretty good number. Nowhere near the number for humans, but um, still indicates a huge amount of work being done by animal geneticists over the last couple of decades. In total, we have now uh, over 1,100 um, likely causal variants, that is, mutations that, that are likely to be the cause of, um, of specific disorders. And uh, the details for all those are now included uh, within OMEA, and um, the chapter and verse about each discovery is there as well. Now let's have a look in, in total at the moment. There are over 26,000 references in OMEA. Most of these are hyperlinked to PubMed and uh, many of them now have direct uh, or provide you with the direct access to the full paper. In 2012, we actually published a hardcover version of the entire contents of OMEA. Um, and then we, uh, when we did this, because there was so much information, about 750,000 words all together. Uh, we squeezed them as much as we could in eight point double column text and it still took up 661 pages. And we did this just to give us an idea of the extent of information that's behind that web page. Because one of the frustrations of working on a web page database like this is that there's no indication when you look at the web page as to just how much information is stored there. So we that's why we did this back in 2012. This is a comparison of the thickness of that volume with a golf ball. Um, we're doing it again now. We're going to, to get a dump of the entire contents of OMEA on the 26th of May, the actual 25th anniversary. And uh, we've already done the sums on that and we've spoken to a printer. And um, uh, in order to print that out at that, again, enormously compressed um, uh, format, uh, we require two volumes now. So there's been a, uh, a fairly large increase in information from 2012 to 2020. And all that information is freely downloadable from the website. The whole database can be downloaded. And that's always been the principle on which both Victor and, and I have operated, that we, we never wanted to put up any paywalls. Of course, the downside of this is that you, you don't generate any income. So we have here now a table from uh, a textbook, Veterinary Genetics, published in 1987, and it lists the entire what, what what was known in its entirety at that stage about uh, lysosomal storage diseases. There were uh, in animals there were 19 combinations of disorder species. Uh, some disorders occurred in more than more than one species. This is an entire list of them here. And in 1987, uh, none of them had uh, any any known mutation. And 33 years later, if we look at OMEA, we now find there's 106 records for lysosomal storage disorders. And, and for about half of those, there's at least one likely causal variant known. So if we look at this output table, 
It's been ranked according to the year in which the mutation was first reported. We find this particular disorder here in dogs, uh, the mutation reported in 1992. Uh, and then this just gives you a bit of an idea about the chronology of the discovery and the table continues beyond where we are now. You can see here the, the range of lysosomal storage disorders and here the range of species. And then for any one of these, if you just click on that hyperlink, you go straight into all the information about that particular disorder. Yeah. Another thing that, uh, that that's very encouraging is that editors are now asking authors to include OMEA IDs in research papers. Just one example, the journal Animal Genetics, a Wiley publication uh, in its author guidelines, it says studies on Mendelian traits should cite the corresponding OMEA code. Um, and that's very encouraging. And also in their list of common scientific abbreviations, uh, toward the bottom we've got OMEA and OMIM. OMEA has increasingly been mentioned in abstracts. If you just search for OMEA in PubMed, you come up with 21 entries. Um, and here's a distribution of them. This 1964 one is a is a, a spurious one. It's not a real one for OMEA. Um, and a couple of others of these are spurious as well. But in more recent years, we get we get papers like this. So this is about a disorder in cattle, um, and and they actually mention OMEA in the um, in the abstract. As many of you probably realise, PubMed searches only on abstract. It does not yet have the resources uh, for uh, for searching the entire text of paper, or it does for a subset of them, but not for all of them. So this is but this is just um, the papers that have been recently published that actually mention OMEA in the abstract or in the title. But if we look at Google Scholar, then we can. Uh, see the results of searching for particular terms, in this case the two URLs, in um, the text as well as the abstract and the title. And here we come uh, up with 642 results, uh, including 26 so far this year. So that gives us uh, a better idea of the extent to which OMEA is being uh, mentioned in publications. OMEA information is being used in research projects. Here's just one example of paper published last year. Uh, and this concerns the concept of what are called buried SNPs. These are SNPs that occur on SNP chips, but which don't have a location allocated to them. And what these researchers did, there's a whole section in their materials methods, was to actually characterize those buried SNPs in a, a cattle SNP chip uh, using information from OMEA. And then they investigated the extent to which those buried SNPs were actually identifying carriers for inherited disorders in Japanese cattle. And it turns out that quite a few of them were. And so this was a really useful uh, exercise uh, for which mirror information was uh, central. Here's another example of OMEA being used in a research project in a paper that was also published last year. In this particular case, it concerns a tool for scoring the impact of single nucleotide variants, that is the extent to which they are deleterious. Uh, and the validation of this was based on information obtained from OMEA. So the present context for OMEA is the, the usage stats is illustrated by the usage stats just for this year. The average monthly number of visits is 5,600 by a monthly average um, 2,900 users. Now these are very small numbers compared with many other internet resources. But these are these are mainly researchers. So at the moment, uh, one of the things we don't have is a is a uh, what we need is a portal for veterinarians, and we need another portal for breeders. But at the moment, OMEA is set up very much as a tool for researchers, and these are mostly researchers that do this. But the reach is very wide. Uh, 124 countries have been. Uh, amongst or, or, or these users have come from 124 countries in the top 10 are USA, Spain, France, Mexico, Russia, Germany, UK, Japan, Netherlands and China. We have several future projects in mind. The first one uh, is almost ready to go and it will start as soon as the COVID uh, pandemic eases off a bit. Uh, it'll be led by um, uh, wonderful colleagues at the Sydney Informatics Hub, and it will involve our colleagues uh, at the European Variation Archive, uh, two wonderful colleagues at Vet Swiss Faculty University of Bern, Tosso and Cord, and uh, Jim and Jilang from Iowa State University. 
And the idea here is to um, work out a, um, a means by which researchers can very easily submit their variants to the European Variation Archive so that it becomes the standard repository. That's its role uh, for all information on variants so that OMEA can then just pull relevant bits of information off when required. That's the first one. The second one is ontologies for OMEA, and this is the, uh, uh, the the only project out of the three that you remember were submitted to the USDA that haven't actually happened, that hasn't actually happened yet. Um, and this involves um, uh, bringing OMEA up to speed with a standard vo global vocabulary for breeds and for phenotypes, especially to do with clinical signs. The standard um, vocabularies already exist, it's just that they don't exist within OMEA. The ones in OMEA are very homegrown by me and they are just not up to uh, the required standards at all. But there's a wonderful group called Demonic Initiative led by Melissa, Chris and Peter. And um, these people are uh, ready to go as soon as we can get some resources. And again, Jim and Ji Lang from animalgeneral.org have also done a lot of work on ontologies, particularly to do with breeds. So we are looking forward to getting this project going as soon as we can. Two more projects in the pipeline. Um, as soon as we get the ontology project finished, we can then think in terms of creating two new portals means of entry into uh, the information, accessing the information in OMEO. One tailored specifically for veterinarians and another one tailored specifically for breeders. Um, and this would, these would be enormous advances. Uh, and as soon as we get the ontologies done, we'll be in a position to do this, to make OMEO much more accessible to veterinarians and to breeders. And another project is creating reciprocal links with Vet Compass. Some of you will have heard of Vet Compass brainchild of Paul McGreevy, a colleague here at the University of Sydney, operating in UK and Australia at the moment, hopefully wider in the future. Uh, and the plan here is to, um, uh, to organise reciprocal links between OMEA and Vet Compass so that the epidemiology data, that uh, the results of the analyses of those data uh, that are relevant to particular disorders can be available. Uh, on the, the relevant uh, OMEA page and that the OMEA portals can be accessible from within Vet Compass. And those two um, advances would be, would be great to achieve. There are two major future challenges. The first one is the succession plan. There will be a continual need for real human creation after I am no longer able to do this. I'm in my middle 70s now and everything's fine, but that's not going to last forever. Uh, and so we have to think in terms of a succession plan. Um, in the recent past, I've given web-based tutorials uh, to local colleagues on, on curation, and I hope soon to do this uh, a little more widely and to put up a few videos even on YouTube. Uh, but we do need to think in terms of um, uh, finding someone who can take over my role. And I think the realities now are that this person would have to be uh, uh, paid in some way uh, for the time that they would have to allocate to this. The other big and continual challenge is maintaining and enhancing the database and the website. Um, this requires regular input from software engineers. I've been able to get little bits of money here and there over the years to enable some enhancements and a bit of maintaining to be done. But um, we need a regular supply of funds to enable this to really happen. And the question is how to fund this, especially in the context that all the information in OMEA has always been and is now freely available. That's been a major philosophical view that both Victor McCusick and I have stuck to. Uh, and so the question is how to how to fund uh, these these necessary costs uh, when you don't charge anything for people accessing the information. Regarding funding, there was a serious sign of the times a couple of years ago when OMIM actually launched a crowdfunding scheme. Um, uh, even though it, it receives regular funding from various American um, uh, resources, uh, it, it realized that it needed 
an independent source of income, just like OMEA it doesn't charge for any of its information. So, but it has it has costs all the time, and so uh, OMIM um, has actually launched this crowdfunding scheme, and I gather it's been quite successful. So in March last year, OMIA launched its own crowdfunding project with help from Joanna Amberger at OMIM and with enormous help from the university's crowdfunding team, uh, we launched this appeal. Um, I am enormously grateful to everyone who has contributed to that. Uh, we're still looking for uh, the one or small number of donors who could really make a difference, uh, but I am enormously grateful to everybody who has made a contribution to this appeal. So in conclusion, EMEA has a long, and for bioinformatics, um, a, uh, a very long history. Uh, it's had contributions from many people all around the world to whom I am enormously grateful. Its influence is widespread and growing. Uh, there's been some recent enhancements courtesy of the University of Sydney and, and, and the collaboration we now have with the Sydney Informatics Hub is, is wonderful and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, the Dean of the Sydney School of Vet Science has also helped. Uh, and the questions still remain about future curation, maintenance and enhancement. And is, is crowdfunding going to be the answer? Is sponsorship the answer? We've even started thinking about sponsorship, but that um, that is a vexed issue. And finally, we come to the acknowledgements. As I say here, there's an enormous number of people who've contributed to OMEA over the decades. I can't mention them all here, uh, but they are all mentioned on the OMEA website. At the University of Sydney, I've received uh, wonderful support from uh, an extensive range of people over the years and organisations within the university. Uh, and I'm exceedingly grateful for that. Uh, I've got a long list of fellow curators and colleagues who also deserve thanks. A full list of the registered curators is here. Um, amongst my immediate colleagues, I would mention Imka, Imka Tumman as being the one who's been helping me, in the especially in the lead up to this uh, the 25th an anniversary. Claire Wade uh, has also been enormously supportive and these other colleagues have contributed in various ways for which I'm very grateful. Tosso Lieb and Cord uh, at the University of Bern have been wonderfully supportive colleagues. Leif Anderson, University of Uppsala has made some amazing discoveries and has been very helpful in how these have been entered into OMEA. Carole Chalier and Michelle Georges from the University of Liège. Uh, Ernie Bailey, I've already mentioned, University of Kentucky, Zilang and Jim, I've mentioned already, Ziyong Lu, I haven't. He's been our major contact um, to do with PubMed at NCBI. Thomas Keane uh, and his colleagues at the European Variation Archive have been very, very um, useful uh, and helpful over the years, and we look forward to collaborating with them on this variant project. And then Melissa Handel, Chris Mungle, and Peter Robinson um, also have been very encouraging on the ontology project, and I look forward to the day when we can put a big tick against that ontology project. So I am just enormously grateful to uh, everyone who's contributed to OMEA's development over the years. I thank you one and all.